In North London, there's a very curious railway line. It runs from Moorgate to Finsbury Park. For much of its length, it's entirely underground. It feels very much like a tube line, but it's part of National Rail. When it was built, it was known as the Great Northern and City Railway. It's also called the Northern City Line. For a time, it was the Northern Line, Highbury Branch. Officially, it's the Moorgate Line. But to many people, for many years, it was the Big Tube. The story of the Big Tube begins at King's Cross, an unrelated station. King's Cross was built by the Great Northern Railway as their London terminus. The Great Northern Railway owned the southern part of the East Coast Main Line, but also a lot of branch lines serving the suburbs and commuter towns north of London. What that meant was that the lines from Finsbury Park into King's Cross were incredibly busy. King's Cross had been built bigger than it needed to be in anticipation of increasing traffic, but in less than half a century it was overwhelmed. The Great Northern made a deal with the North London Railway to use their terminus at Broad Street, but it wasn't ideal. The relationship between the two companies was kind of shaky. Then, in 1891, the Great Northern were approached with a new and very out-of-the-box idea. The man at the centre of the scheme was James Henry Greathead. Greathead, whose statue stands outside Bank Station, was the inventor of the tunnelling shield that made deep-level underground lines possible. He was a smart fellow. You might say that he had a great head upon his shoulders. The proposal was this. A deep-level tube line constructed to a width able to take full-sized rolling stock, running from Finsbury Park into the city. Great Northern trains would come into Finsbury Park, the steam locomotive would be uncoupled, and an electric locomotive, described as a tractor in the proposal, would haul the train along the tube line. In the long term, the plan was for the Great Northern to electrify its suburban lines, eliminating the locomotive changeover. The tube line was to be the Great Northern and City Railway. The GNCR was an independent company, but the hope was that the Great Northern would take an interest in it. I suspect the idea was that it would have been something like the Waterloo and City Line, which was independent in theory, but in practice was effectively an extension of the London and South Western Railway. And at first, everything seemed to be going to plan, with two Great Northern directors on the GNCR board. Except then the Great Northern started being weird about it. Not long after the GNCR was proposed, another tube railway called the Great Northern and Strand Railway was also put forward, and the Great Northern Railway's support became divided between the two lines. This would come back to bite them later. If you're curious about that other tube line, it would eventually be built as part of the Piccadilly line. The GNCR had trouble raising money to get the line built, and the Great Northern decided it was all too spicy for them and withdrew in 1900, concentrating their support on the other tube line. They also obtained parliamentary powers to prevent the GNCR from running any further than Finsbury Park. In any case, it seemed unlikely that the Great Northern would get their own line electrified any time soon. Instead of building a connection between the GNCR and the main line at Finsbury Park, they would build a tube station underneath. This rather changed things for the GNCR. Nevertheless, they eventually did raise the money, and in 1898 work was begun. Oddly enough, even though the original connection with the Great Northern was abandoned, construction mostly proceeded as if everything was going as normal. Tunnels were built to a diameter of 16 feet, much larger than a conventional tube tunnel. An unusual system of electrification was used where the live and return rails were outside the running rails. The reason being that in those early days of electric traction, it was assumed that an engine powerful enough to haul a full-size train would have a massive motor attached to its axle that could potentially foul any rail between the running rails. The line was 3.4 miles long with six stations. It began at Moorgate. Next was Old Street, built jointly with the City and South London Railway, then Essex Road in Islington, and Highbury, just over the road from the North London Railway's station. Drayton Park was the site of the line's depot and the only station in the open air. And finally, the terminus at Finsbury Park. There was a connection to the surface here, but in the goods yard rather than at the station. 
Electricity for the line was generated at a power station by the Regent's Canal in Shoreditch. There was an idea to extend to Lothbury. This was authorised in 1902. It would have been a very short extension, only 270 yards. In other words, the distance between the two stations was less than the length of a train. Ideally, they would have liked a station at Bank, but the City and South London railway tunnels got in the way, and the owners of the buildings above didn't much like the idea of having a tube line so close to the surface. Construction actually began on the Lothbury extension, but it was quickly abandoned. Nevertheless, the tunnelling shield is still down there, and the tunnels do still extend a short distance beyond Moorgate. The idea was revived in 1907, but again, got nowhere. The company had to acquire its own trains, and adopted the then fairly new concept of multiple units, where the motors were mounted in the carriages rather than using a separate locomotive. The trains were supplied by Brush, and by the Electric Tramway Railway and Carriage Works. The bodywork was teak with interior mahogany panelling. The Big Tube opened in February 1904, with the exception of Highbury, which opened in June that year. And at first it was a success. The Great Northern continued to be flaky, and they realised that the GNCR was actually quite a useful thing, particularly when adverse weather made conditions on the lines into King's Cross difficult. They once again allied with the Big Tube to sell through tickets. But the Golden Age was short-lived. In 1907, electric trams came to North London and offered cheap fares. Within a year, passenger numbers had declined from 16 million per annum to 12 million. The problem was that the line just wasn't much use on its own. It had been designed as a supplemental service. In 1913, a new player entered the game in the form of the Metropolitan Railway. The Metropolitan Railway owned a line through Moorgate, so it made a certain amount of sense for them to acquire the GNCR, which they did. The Great Northern opposed the takeover, fearing competition for the northern suburbs. But then, in their typically flip-flopping fashion, in 1914 they joined forces. The two companies came up with grand schemes like extending to Aldgate and reviving the extension to Bank. They seriously considered building connections to the Circle and Waterloo and City lines, perhaps even the East London line. The North London Railway interfered with the parliamentary application, insisting on clauses that would make this scheme unworkable. So the Metropolitan had, in the end, made a bad bargain. The line would continue to exist in isolation, of little more use to the Met than it had been as an independent entity. There were changes. The Met generated their own power and sold the GNCR power station off, which became Gainsborough Film Studios. They introduced the only first-class service on a deep-level tube line in 1915. They supplemented the GNCR trains with a few cars of their own. Maintenance was now carried out at Neesden, which was a pain because the old trains couldn't fit through the tunnels at Baker Street and had to go the long way around via the district line. By the 1920s, the Great Northern's refusal to allow any other company to get north of Finsbury Park had been a cause of chaos. Now, both the GNCR and the Piccadilly Tube terminated there, creating a pinch point. The station and its surrounding streets were severely, even dangerously, overcrowded by people changing from tubes to trams and buses. The electric trams were cheaper, cleaner and more modern than the old-fashioned steam trains of the Great Northern. Many of the buses, not coincidentally, were owned by the Underground Group, who also owned the Piccadilly Tube and ran the bus services in direct competition with the railway. The Great Northern and its successor, the London and North Eastern Railway, argued for keeping the present arrangement because they were totally going to get their lines electrified, honest, any day now. In 1923, fed-up locals put a petition to Parliament, and in 1925, Parliament told the London and North Eastern Railway to, how can I put this politely, defecate or vacate the chamber pot. This allowed the Piccadilly line to build an extension to Cockfosters, but the impact on the big tube would be felt in the 1930s. In 1933, the entire underground network became part of London Transport, including the Metropolitan and all its holdings. In 1934, a proposal was made to extend to Mansion House, but that didn't get too far. In 1935, the New Works programme was published. This was a grand scheme to renovate the entirety of London's transport network, 
and it included some big plans for the big tube. It would be transferred from the Metropolitan to what would soon be called the Northern Line. Also to be transferred to the Northern Line were some of the London and North Eastern Railway's branch lines in North London, what were known as the Northern Heights Lines. Northern Line trains would be able to run from Moorgate up through Finsbury Park over a new connection and on to High Barnet, Edgware, Alexandra Palace and along a new line to Bushy Heath. It seems like a solid plan. In 1939 the big tube became a small tube, the Northern City Line. The electrical systems were renovated in line with those on the rest of the network and the trains were scrapped and replaced with a class of train known as the Standard Stock constructed to the normal deep-level tube gauge. Well, the punchline to all this is that the Northern Heights programme didn't really happen. The Second World War took place and following that a combination of a lack of money, changing transport priorities and Greenbelt legislation killed the programme half-finished. Once again, the big tube had been robbed of a chance to be useful. In 1964, change came at Finsbury Park. A new tube line was being constructed, the Victoria Line. The old GNCR platforms offered good interchange with the Piccadilly Line, so London Transport decided to route the Victoria Line through those. The northbound Northern City platform at Highbury and Islington was also taken over by the Victoria Line, again for the purposes of easy interchange. It would become the southbound Victoria Line platform and the old Highbury station building closed in 1968. The building was retained and it now houses signalling equipment. New tunnels were dug for the Northern City and during this time the line terminated at Drayton Park. In 1970 the Northern City was renamed again to the Northern Line, Highbury branch. But it was very clear that the underground had little use for the big tube. In 1966 the line had received new trains, but they were in fact the far from new 1938 stock. That's where the line stood in London Transport's priorities. In 1969 British Rail finally, finally indicated their intention to electrify the old Great Northern Suburban lines. As part of this plan, agreement was reached with London Transport to construct that link at Finsbury Park, to take the Highbury branch over and run suburban trains into Moorgate. In other words, after more than 70 years, the Great Northern and City Railway would finally be put to the use it was designed for. Construction was begun with the aim of handing over in 1975. So it's perhaps ironic that on the 28th of February 1975, the Northern City platforms at Moorgate would see the worst peacetime disaster in the history of the underground. A train entered Platform 9 much too fast, ploughed straight through the buffers and into the wall. 43 people, including the driver, were killed. The exact cause is unknown to this day, although there have been plenty of theories over the years. The fact that the train consisted of 1938 stock running in a mainline-sized tunnel was a contributing factor to the disaster. The third carriage was able to ride over the second, crushing it. Nevertheless, in October 1975 the handover was carried out and in 1976 the first British Rail services ran over the Northern City Line. No longer was it the big tube, now it was the regular sized ordinary railway that happens to run underground. Which is far less catchy and that's probably why many people still call it the Northern City Line. Officially, though, it's known as the Moorgate Line. With a direct connection from Finsbury Park to the city, services into Broad Street were ended, a contributing factor to that station's closure in 1986. These days, the Northern City is just another branch of the North London suburban network. Every so often, an idea will be put forward to do something with it. For instance, there was a proposal by the Green Party in 2007 to connect it to the Waterloo and City Line, Although the amount of construction work needed to integrate those two lines is so major that I don't think the proposal is remotely practical. More promising is a proposal from Heidi Alexander, London's Deputy Mayor for Transport in 2018, to add it to the London Overground, along with the lines to Stevenage and Enfield. The argument being that this would offer a far better service than that provided by Govia Thameslink at the time. 
However, the most recent update I've found on that comes from 2020 and suggested that it should take place by September 2022, and, well, here we are. So, who knows? Perhaps the northern city will become part of an exciting new development in London's transport, or perhaps, once again, it will be thwarted. Well, I hope you enjoyed this big tale from the tube. If you did, please do click the like button and consider subscribing for more. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your ever-generous support. You are the tractor to my carriages. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.